Well, this morning we have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a relatively short text, um, Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. There's really so much in this passage that I didn't want to just tack it on to last week's, which is why I split those two. Uh, entirely different topic as well. Last week we were looking at the, the, the Spirit's guidance. This week we're going to be looking at His work in conversion. So let me begin by reading the, the passage. If I can find it here, let's see, it's um, Acts 16 beginning in verse 11. I'd like to read through uh, verse 15. So putting out to sea from <coughs> Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and on the, following, on the day following to Neapolis and from there to Philippi which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Well, may the Lord bless this uh, short passage to our growth and grace this morning. Now, last time, as I've already mentioned, we saw the Spirit's involvement in the missionary effort. Paul and Silas and Timothy continued to move forward. They wanted to break new ground, to bring the gospel where Jesus had not yet been named so that God would be glorified. You might say there's sort of an economy of effort here. Why bring the gospel to a, a country that already has enough churches to witness to it, or at least a gospel witness when there are so many places that don't? Well, as they were doing this, the Spirit was sovereignly guiding them empowering them to preach in some areas, but preventing them from ministering the gospel in others. We saw that even though they had to pass through Asia Minor, as they were basically going from Derby and Lystra to Troas, the Spirit would not let them evangelize in any of the cities, um, at least not at that time. We're going to see this morning that he may have had another way, that he may have had another way in which he was going to reach them. And when they tried in Troas to go into Bithynia, which was essentially north of where they were, the Spirit again stopped them. Now that's because He has His time to reach His people. And there's really nothing that can be done, you know, humanly speaking, about that. And we really shouldn't want to do anything about that because God is sovereign. The Spirit is the one who is leading His people to speak to those who are basically the ones He is intending to save. Now, the Spirit guides us today as well. When it is the day of salvation for His chosen ones, He brings one of His messengers. He brings perhaps one of us with the gospel. And then, of course, as we're going to see this morning, He makes it powerful to save. But let me also mention this. It's not just when He's bringing somebody to salvation. It's also when He wants to break ground in, in new areas or perhaps in new hearts, people who've never heard the gospel before. It's when he wants to plant the seed of the gospel. It's when he wants the gospel watered. You know, there's, there's a process that goes on here. We just simply need to be open to, to being used by him uh, in this way, to share the gospel, because that's what happens when you're breaking ground, planting, watering, or even bringing to harvest. It comes through sharing the gospel. Now, we also saw the vision that the Spirit gave Paul, the man from Macedonia, remember, pleading with him to come to Macedonia, which is essentially Greece, and to help them. This morning, we see why it was the Spirit wanted them to go. It's because he was intending on saving some people who were in Philippi. <clears throat> now, this morning, I want us to consider three things from this passage. First of all, the Spirit is the one who opens the heart to receive the gospel. I think that point's come across. Secondly, in His mercy, He sometimes saves entire households. And that seems to be 
really an exception rather than a rule, I think, in Scripture. And when he saves, he changes the life. They were no longer what they were before. So first of all, let's look at this first point, which is really the main point. We see the Spirit is the one who opens the heart to receive the gospel. Now Luke tells us that Paul and Silas and Timothy, and remember now Luke, landed um, at, uh, well, they first went through Samothrace, and then they landed in Neapolis, and the word essentially, the name in the Greek means the new city. On the eastern coast of Macedonia, again Greece, and from there they moved inland to Philippi. Philippi, as you know, is a city where a church is, we're going to see it being planted here, and Paul's going to later write a letter. The, uh, Philippi was named after Philip II. You think you see the connection there of Macedonia. He was the king of Macedon and the father of Alexander the Great. During the time of Caesar Augustus, this city was established as a military colony to control a district which had recently been conquered. So it was essentially, as some would call it, a miniature Rome under the law of Rome and governed by military officers. Now, the great Greek scholar A.T. Robertson notes this. Here, he says, Paul is face to face with the Roman power and empire in a new sense. He was a new Alexander come from Asia to conquer Europe for Christ a new Caesar to build the kingdom of Christ on the work of Alexander and Caesar. Interesting way of putting it. But that's really what happens when someone comes with the gospel. It's not just to evangelize individuals that they might be saved. It's basically to conquer the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light and to expand the rule of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the kingdom of God is, the rule of Christ in this world. Now, all of this begins with the conversion of Lydia. After they had been there a short while, Luke tells us they went outside the gate of the city to a riverside on the Sabbath day. Now, it could be that their survey of the city on those previous days failed to turn up a synagogue, or they already knew there were no synagogues in Philippi. But in either case, they were looking for the next best thing, and that was a place of prayer. A place of prayer is not just, you know, people gathering willy-nilly. It's the place where the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles would gather for worship when there was no synagogue because one had not yet been established. One commentator writes this, according to later Jewish practice, at least 10 men were required to form a synagogue. Failing that, a place of prayer could be established outdoors, preferably near water. Now, he didn't explain that, so I looked that up. Basically, whenever a synagogue was established or wherever they established these places of prayer, they wanted to be near water because they needed to go through their purification rituals, and it's easier to do where water is readily available. Now, the commentator goes on, although various local and imported pagan religions flourished in Philippi, the city likely had no Jewish synagogue for instruction in Israel's scriptures and prayer to the true and living God. So Paul and his team, as they would in any other place, they want to seek out the Jews first, and they're in the synagogues. But not finding a synagogue, they went to this place of prayer, or at least looking for one. And Luke tells us they weren't disappointed. They found that place, and they found also some women who had gathered together for worship, uh, to read and study the Scriptures, and to pray. Now, I think the fact that there were no men present is, is actually quite telling. It probably means that all of these women were actually God-fearing Gentiles and not necessarily Jewesses. Uh, we know that Lydia, for instance, was a worshiper of God, and that means that she was a God-fearer, not that she was a, a Jew, okay? Uh, no Jewish husband, think about this, would have ever failed to turn up to worship God on his holy day according to God's commandment, that these women would be there by themselves if they're Jewesses and they're married. That couldn't be the case. And it's unlikely that they, all of them were unmarried, or perhaps were, were widowed or divorced Jewesses, okay? So I think what we have here is a gathering of women who were God-fearers. 
Now, being worshipers of God and not having the blessing of a synagogue, which would have included a rabbi and some elders who would be able to lead them and teach them in the ways of, of Yahweh, they would have welcomed any Jewish rabbi, any Jewish teacher who happened to be visiting them. Well, on this occasion, they're blessed to see that the Lord brought four. And uh, you know, Luke basically tells us that they were all teaching the women. But as Paul was teaching, the Lord opened the heart of a woman named Lydia. Now, Luke gives us a little bit of information about Lydia. Okay, Lydia was a God-fearing Gentile, as we've just seen. Notice she was from Thyatira. That, that's very interesting because Thyatira is in Asia Minor. Thyatira is one of the seven uh, churches that are addressed in the book of Revelation. Thyatira is in that area where the Spirit said, don't preach, basically, through, all, you know, through the entirety of Asia Minor. So it's quite possible that this is how the Lord planted this church, by converting somebody with the means to be able to establish a church because she had an established business in Philippi selling, as Luke tells us, the expensive purple fabrics that Thyatira was famous for. Apparently, they were able to produce some type of a dye. This dye was widely used, and in particular, it was used by the Romans. And now, she would have the desire to plant such a church when she heard the gospel she believed. Now, what I'd like us to do here is just focus in on why it is that Lydia believed. You know, who it was that enabled her to do this. Notice who it was that opened her heart. It was the Lord. Now, when we say the word Lord, we realize the word can actually refer to any of the three persons of the Godhead. When Jesus told his disciples to go and baptize the nations those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with, you know, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, he was basically saying, do it in the name of Yahweh because Yahweh refers to all three of these persons. Yahweh is the covenant Lord of, of Israel. But I think in this particular case, the one who opened her heart, of course, was the Holy Spirit. And we know that because of what we read in John 3.3, 3, what Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, while Paul was teaching the gospel, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to receive that. She was born again. She saw the kingdom, and she entered through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that birth, Jesus says to Nicodemus, comes from the Holy Spirit. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, this is in the same context of the new birth. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. It is the Spirit's work in redemption to apply what Jesus has done. I mean, what Jesus has done remains simply uh, something, well, what do you want to say, theoretical, but not really applied until one of the three persons of the Godhead applies it. And it is the Spirit of God who does that. And when He does, what He does is give a new heart. He gave her a new love for God. And as I mentioned before, in this debate between um, Augustus Toplady and John Wesley, you know, God needs to get the glory for that. Uh, and the reason that Augustus Toplady believed what he believed and why it differed from John Wesley was because he believed what the Bible had to say about man's nature Apart from this new birth, what man is like, the Bible says that Lydia, apart from God's grace, actually hated God. And as a matter of fact, everyone does apart from Christ. That which is born of the flesh, remember, is flesh. And that's what we were when we came into the world. And what does the flesh enable you to do? Well, it's, what's more important here is what it, it doesn't enable you to do. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 7 and 8, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, hostile toward God, hates God. And by the way, the mind set on the flesh, that's everyone except those who have the Spirit, because those who have the Spirit have the mind of the Spirit. So the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, what that means is Lydia listening to Paul 
if she was in the flesh, would have basically brushed off everything he said, would not have believed, would not have responded, maybe even said, get lost, or began to persecute him. This is what the Spirit of God did in her life. Now, the other thing we need to bear in mind is this. God showed her mercy. The Spirit of God applied Christ to her because she was, I want to say unique, but she was one of many that are categorized in Scripture as those who belong to Jesus Christ, to those who are His sheep. Let's not forget, Jesus says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. Okay? Those who aren't a sheep don't. And I know them, not just that He knows who they are, but He loves them, and they follow me. By the way, He goes on to say He lays down His life for them. Now, His sheep, my sheep, He says, these sheep are those the Father has given to Him, he says that in, in the same context. And from what he says in verse 26 of this uh, Good Shepherd discourse, uh, it's clear that the Father has not given everyone to Jesus. He said to the Jews, and I think this is perhaps the, the most, perhaps one of the clearest passages in Scripture, that the sheep does not refer to everyone who believes. You know, essentially you believe and you become one of his sheep and if, if everyone would simply trust in Jesus, they would be a part of these sheep. No, you have to be a sheep before you can believe. He says to the Jews who were arguing with him, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Because my sheep are those whom the Father has given to me. They are the ones that the Father will draw to me. And if, if they come to me, he says in John 6, I'm not going to cast them out. Because they're my reward, Jesus says, for doing what it is I have done, for living and dying for them. This is the reward, my sheep. And my Father has given them to me. And he says, I know them, and they follow me. They follow him, which means they no longer live for themselves, but they live for God. They live for his glory. So the point here is this. The only reason why we have trusted Jesus the only reason why we follow Jesus, the only reason why anyone else will ever trust and follow Jesus is because the Father chose us and in His time sent His gospel to us and the Spirit of God to open our hearts. Now again, that is our confidence as we evangelize, as we're going to see this evening. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The Spirit of God is the one who makes that gospel powerful. Now, we are the ones who are God's appointed messengers to bring the gospel to others, but the one who's going to make that gospel powerful to save is the Spirit. We can't. Remember what R.C. Sproul says, we can give proof, but we can't give persuasion. The Spirit of God needs to give that persuasion, and He will do it if that person belongs to Jesus and if it is God's timing, okay? So it all depends upon Him, and that's a very important thing to see as we move on to this next point. Secondly, sometimes the Lord in His mercy will save an entire household. Now, let's, let's admit at the outset, as we look at Lydia and her household, we really don't know very much about her. You know, we know that she's from Thyatira, we know that she has a business and she sells purple fabric, but outside of that, we don't know very much. For instance, we don't know whether Lydia was married. Luke doesn't tell us. Now, since she was running her own business, something that is, you know, if we read our culture back into that culture, we'd say, well, of course, lots of women had businesses. But no, that wasn't the case. This is, this is unusual that she would have her own business. Uh, it's likely that she was not married. Okay, the fact that she will welcome these missionaries into her home without any mention of her husband or his permission, okay? That also seems to bear this out. Now, it's possible that she could have been married at one time. It's possible that she was divorced. It's possible that she was widowed. She may never have been married, okay? We don't know. Secondly, there's also no mention of children, okay? She might have had children, um, again, if she had possibly been married before. Uh, those children could have been young, they could have been old, they could have been out of the house. We just don't know because Luke doesn't tell us, okay? 
But there is something I think we can deduce from this passage. I think we can know that she had servants in her house. I mean, she's a woman of means. She's running a business. How do you run business, especially a lucrative one, without servants? Okay, and I didn't mention this before, but this purple fabric was, was in demand, a very expensive fabric. As a matter of fact, they used it on the official togas of Rome. I thought that was kind of uh, an interesting fact. Well, having servants, think about this. You're the head of your household. You're a God-fearing Gentile. You've adopted Israel's worship. You've adopted the day of worship. What are you going to do with your household? Remember, these aren't just servants. These are people that basically belong to you, and you have control over them. And now you're, you're basically following the Jewish religion. What are you going to do with these servants on the Sabbath? Well, I think it's very likely that she brought those servants with her to worship God on the Sabbath according to the commandment. I mean, God requires the whole household rest, no work on this day, so that they might worship God. And every head of household would lead his household in the worship of God. Now, some commentators believe that at least some of the women that were present at this prayer meeting, perhaps all of them, were Lydia's servants, and that they too were worshipers of God. And it's also quite possible that, that though Luke focuses on Lydia, perhaps because, again, she's a woman of means, and may have been the means of planting the church in Thyatira, you know, we read in church history about how women of means greatly promoted the, the gospel, evangelism, the Reformed faith, and so forth. Um, so he may be focusing on her for that purpose. But even though he does that, it may be that these other women also believed and were saved. We have an interesting statement at the end of this chapter. Luke will later tell us that when Paul and Silas are released from the Philippian jail, they go back to Lydia's house to encourage the brethren. See, at this point, there's a collection of believers now in, in the house. And one Reformed commentator writes this, brothers or brethren would include all the believers, Lydia, her household, the jailer, perhaps other women at the riverbank, and the others who responded to Paul and Silas's preaching. So what I'm saying here is it's quite possible that all of Lydia's household believed and according to Jesus' commandment, were baptized. And the point is this, that that is an exception rather than a rule in Scripture, at least as I read the Scriptures. Uh, sometimes the Lord saves entire households. We do have a few of those spattered through the book of Acts and some references to them in the letters. But think about what Jesus said to his disciples when he sent them out to preach in Matthew 10, 34 through 36. Tell me if this sounds like someone who believed that most households were actually going to all be saved. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Well, that's pretty startling. He seems to be saying here that the gospel is more likely to divide a family than to unite it. And I think many of us here have found that actually to be true in our own experience. It hasn't united our households, but rather it has divided us. But thankfully, there are exceptions to this. And by the way, the last day is not taking place yet. We don't know what's going to happen in these divisions, whether they're going to be healed. But there are exceptions in Scripture that give us some hope, I think. Now, Lydia's household, as I've argued, we don't know exactly what her household was like, but on the premise that what I've said is, is right, it was different than ours, wasn't it? it? It was likely made up of Lydia and her servants, okay? But notice the gospel united them when they could have just as easily been divided, right? Uh, same thing could happen to them. They're all human beings. We'll see next time that it also united the Philippian jailer's household, okay? Now, the question is, what makes the difference? Why is it the gospel sometimes divides households and sometimes unites households? Well, obviously, it's what we saw in the first point. It's the Lord's sovereign electing grace. The Lord said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. 
and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And Paul concludes from that statement, so then justification, salvation does not depend on the man who wills. Remember what Jesus said in, in John 1. They weren't born of the will of man. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs or the man who acts, but on God. Okay, it depends on God who has mercy. Now, if we have done what the Lord calls us to do, if we have raised our children in the ways of the Lord, if we have faithfully brought them to worship, if we've shown them their need of trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they haven't yet come to Him, ultimately it's because the Lord has not yet called them. We need to remember that only He can save them, and He will only if He has chosen them. That's, that's the harder thing to deal with because we don't know that if He has chosen them. But if He has, He will also do it in His time. We just simply need to be faithful in doing what the Lord has called us to do. Trust Him and then wait and see what the Lord has planned. I hope, I hope that's clear. Okay? We can't save them. And the fact that they're born in our household does not mean that they're necessarily going to be saved because the gospel divides, perhaps more often than it actually unites. It depends on God's will. Now, finally, this last point is very brief. When he saves, he changes the life, doesn't he? Lydia was not who she was before. She believed, she was baptized, and then she urged them. Think about this. You know, people that she hadn't actually met, she had known them for just maybe an hour or two, but she urged them, Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke, I want you all to come into my house and stay because I want to support the work of God's kingdom. I'd say that's a pretty radical change in, in her life. And the point is simply this. When the Spirit converts, He changes, doesn't He? He turns the heart, the desires, the affections, the, the, the want to in our lives in a Godward direction so that we begin to seek God's glory. That's what we want. We want to promote His work. We want Him to be known instead of just thinking about how we can make our lives nicer, okay? The Spirit converts. He gives us the ability to put the kingdom of heaven first, which is what Jesus said we must do if we are to receive the promise even of His provision of taking care of us. Now, that is how we can know Lydia was actually converted. That's how we can know we are converted. That's how we can know others are converted. When they do more than just simply say, I believe what the Bible teaches, and then they just kind of go off and do their own thing. But when they actually begin to devote their lives to the service of God, that's how we know. That's how we know for ourselves. That's how we know for others. Well, let's stop here and let's uh, bow and let's, uh, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us remember these things and to depend on Him when it comes to serving the Lord in this way. Let's examine our hearts with regard to whether we put the kingdom of heaven first. None of us have the way we should. None of us have done it perfectly. Not even the missionaries who live in grass huts on the fields. You know, this is a struggle against self. We all have something that we need to repent of before we come to the table. But let's thank the Lord that He will graciously, mercifully forgive us everything if we just simply look to Him and confess our sins. Uh, he is continually cleansing us as we do this. He keeps us in the grace of God. So let's, let's do so.